Hello, everyone. It's, uh, everyone should be coming in now. Um, welcome. Sorry for the delay, everyone. Just having yeah, a couple of technological issues there. Um, you'd think that after this long in a pandemic world, <laughs> we will keep you on top of that, but I uh, apologize. Um, but yeah, so I think um, that everyone um, should be coming in soon. So I would just like to welcome everyone um, to the last for the year, but certainly not least, um, online ASHA seminar for the year, um, which is very exciting. Um, it's been a, a really good year of different um, different talks ranging in so, so many different topics. And it's been an absolute pleasure to host these and to have um, such experts talk to us about um, the research, which is fabulous. Um, so I would just like to start off with um, acknowledgement of countries. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, wherever we are, to me it's in the Gadigal, um, people of the Aura Nation, um, and I would like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. So, um, and without further ado, I shall um, pop it over to Heather. Thank you, Heather. Thanks, Ellie. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm talking to you from Ghana country today because I'm in Adelaide. But just thinking about what Ellie just said about acknowledgement of country, in the context of this talk, I'd actually like to acknowledge the country of all of the groups who worked with us throughout this project. Because for all of them, for all Aboriginal people, that country was never ceded. But the thing I'm going to talk to you about today, the Queensland Native Mounted Police, that was one of the major mechanisms by which that country was taken away from them nonetheless. So I'd just like to acknowledge all of those elders past and present and all of that country never ceded. Um, obviously, you can see from the slide I'm speaking to you today, but I'm speaking to you on behalf of a much larger team. And I notice Lindley Wallace is online. So I had many colleagues from many universities, but there were a whole range of students and volunteers and other people who helped us throughout this project. So I'm speaking on all of their behalves today. And I'd like to kind of start with these two images that you can see in front of you, because these are the images for me that got me thinking about who the Native Manor Police were and what they represented. And you can see they're both um, from about the same time. They're both from the, the 1880s. They're both from far north Queensland, but they represent two very different portraits of the Queensland Native Mounted Police. You can see the one on the left is the camp of Lower Laura at Baralga in Cape York Peninsula. And you can see that's an image of domestic order. There's lots, there's a row of troopers, their wives are in front of them, there's a small child on one man's lap. So it represents that kind of typical Europeanized landscape, people in European clothes, um, standing to attention, having their photo taken formally. It's got a, lot, a nice sense of calm, order, and hierarchy in it. The photo on the, uh, the image on the right though, is from a series of image, a series of drawings by Oscar, who was a young Aboriginal boy who was taken by the Native Mounted Police and given to a pastoralist at Camerwheel when he was about nine or 10 years old. And later in his life, when he was a teenager, Oscar drew a whole series of images from his memory and his time with the Native Mounted Police. He probably was born on the Palmer River, so in the same region as Baralga and in the 1880s. And many of his images represent the Native Mounted Police on their various activities. This particular one is called Dispersing Usual Way, Some Good Shooting because Oscar also labelled all of his images and told us what they represented. So for me, these two portraits were like polar opposites. One was this series of scene of domestic familiarity and order. One was the punitive reputation of the Native Mounted Police, which still hangs around today, but which absolutely defined their activities. Our project really set out to try and investigate these two aspects of this same organisation. We wanted to unpack some of those complexities and understand how the Native Mounted Police and frontier conflict unfolded in Queensland historically, spatially um, and materially. So I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour of the last six years of our lives now. For those of you who don't know, the um, Mounted Police was, the Queensland Native Mounted Police was formed in 1848 
And it was explicitly designed to protect the lives, the livelihoods and the livestock of European settlers. They were brought into a particular area of what was then Northern New South Wales, which is that McIntyre River area, the borderland between Queensland and Northern New South Wales. And they were brought in specifically to that region because a war had been going on between the white settlers and the Aboriginal uh, people for the previous six years. And the Native Manor Police were organized and imported specifically to end that conflict. But in a lot of ways, they weren't unusual, right? So the Native Manor Police was um, an extension of a long British tradition of using Indigenous forces to police other Indigenous people because they were cheap, they were expedient, they were effective, and it almost weaponized the kind of nascent or real or actual um, enmities between groups. So it, it used, it harnessed that insider knowledge and it harnessed those enmities and focus them in a way that allowed the Europeans to, um, to achieve their ends. And you find these kinds of colonial policing forces across many of the British colonies. They're in India, they're in Canada, South Africa, Ceylon. And so in many ways, the Australian version wasn't that different. We'd also had other colonial policing forces in Australia. So even in Australia, they weren't that unusual. But mostly those were very short term in the 1830s and the 1840s in other colonies. What made the Queensland version different and unique was their longevity. So they lasted from 1848 right through until the early years of the 20th century, which is more than 50 years, that whole second half of the 19th century. And they spanned an area as far south as Grafton in New South Wales and as far north as the very tip of Cape York and as far west as the border of the Northern Territory in Queensland. So there was no part of the colony that was left untouched by their activities. Um, they were also interesting because they, they operated in that blurred space between civilian policing and military activity. And the thing about the Queensland Native Mounted Police is that they were explicitly organized as a corps from the beginning. So they drew explicitly on a military ideology for their formation and their structure and their activities and they were permanently armed. So even though they were called a police, they weren't at all like the civilian police forces you had in towns. They were explicitly paramilitary and almost military in their attitudes. Um, before we started this project, there'd been various uh, historians who'd worked on various elements of either frontier conflict in general or the Native Mounted Police in particular. The two important ones for us were the one on the far left of this slide, Police of the Pastoral Frontier by Leslie Skinner, who looked at that early 1840s, 1850s period in northern New South Wales, southern Queensland, and then the one that's four across from that, The Secret War by Jonathan Richards, who took over where Skinner left off once Queensland had become its own colony and looked at the native mounted police from 1859 onwards. But most of these works, like they were good general historical introductions to the Native Mounted Police, but they didn't really deal with the kinds of issues that we wanted to explore. One of the, I guess, one of the issues with the archaeology of this, because the idea of using archaeology to try and find some material trace of this frontier conflict had been mooted since the early 2000s, but it hadn't really been taken up. And one of the reasons for that is it's, it's quite complicated to try and investigate frontier conflict archaeologically as some of our own team members had published and talked about previously. So the nature of frontier conflict in Queensland or in Australia was quite different to what you had in other countries, right? You had small groups of people who were usually being attacked in punitive raids. They were often being killed across large distances. Those bodies were sometimes burnt or sometimes just left out on the surface. So you had all the taphonomic problems with any kind of body recovery which means archaeologically it's very difficult to find any kind of trace of those activities. So from the outset, when we first talked about it, none of us were really interested in trying to find putative massacre sites, which is the kind of sensationalist term that, you know, most people would understand. There's a whole, you know, for all of those archaeological taphonomic reasons, it's highly unlikely, not impossible, but highly unlikely, we will ever find those kinds of sites. So we decided that we'd focus on a more materially abundant indicator 
of the Native Mountain Police. We'd focus on their campsites and try and find where they were located, what those camps contained, and what that could tell us about the experience of the men in those camps. So we really did want to try and understand the lives of the officers and the troopers, the men who were who constituted this force and who carried out these activities. When we began, this was literally the information that we had. So Jonathan Richards, who's one of the preeminent historians on the Queensland Native Mounted Police, he'd done some work for his PhD in 2005 to try and work out how many camps there were and he'd had a go at mapping it. You can see his maps there on the right, but um, no offence meant to Jonathan, but as an historian, he wasn't particularly interested in the kinds of geographical mapping that we as archaeologists are. So mostly he had just mapped the names of camps to sort of geographic indicators like towns or rivers. They weren't specific locations and none of those maps were actually useful to us to try and find those sites. But Jonathan thought there were maybe 84 campsites across Queensland. So that's where we started. We knew that from Jonathan's work that many of these camps were very short-lived, so they were unlikely to have any archaeological traces still attached to them. We also, But we did know that some, in fact, were quite long, had lasted for decades, so we were more hopeful of those. We obviously knew there'd be very little trace in the heavily uh, populated coastal areas, but the further west we went, they'd be more likely to be preserved archaeological remains. And we also had the good fortune to have Nolan Cole on our team, who had previously done work on the Lower Laura camp, that camp you saw in that very first slide, in Cape York at Baralga. So we actually knew where one camp was before we started. Uh, we also started on a process at the same time of trying to gather all of the historical information that existed about these camps. So in a sense, retracing Jonathan's steps because all the information that he'd gathered for his PhD, we needed to gather that again because we didn't have access to it. So we spent a lot of time in the archives, gathering that information, transcribing those documents and trying to work out where all of these camps were. My slides have disappeared from my screen. So yeah. tell me if you can still see it, I don't know. Um, I, I think something weird happened. I think someone accidentally tried to share a screen. So if you can try sharing it again, apologies. Yes, that's good again. Excellent. Thank Hello, you. everyone. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we set out to do a lot of driving. <laughs> we did a lot of driving, a lot of searching, a lot of walking, and a lot of talking. We travelled tens of thousands of kilometres all across Queensland and we literally talked to anyone who would talk to us. We spoke to property owners and managers, members of historical societies, random people we met anywhere. Um, and we deliberately tried to find as many descendants of officers and troopers as we could and people with knowledge about the Native Man of Police. But the other thing we wanted to know was how general that knowledge was, so how widespread or how well-known or not well-known the Native Man of Police were in Queensland. So we did literally speak to anyone who would talk to us. What we found was a total of 189 camps, so up from Jonathan's 84 to a current number of 189, which kind of changed our perspective on the contributions of the Native Man of Police to Queensland history. Um, we never expected that we would find all of those in the field. And in fact, we didn't even try to find most of them. We, um, in the end, we managed to find 48 on the ground. So with a lot of searching, a lot of archival work, a lot of talking to people, we found 48 and 37 of those had visible material traces that we could record. So we actually spent a lot of time recording those. Eight of them we excavated in detail or made surface collections from. So out of that total of 189, our sample is eight. But at the same time, we also recorded a whole lot of other sites that were associated with the Native Mounted Police, um, including pastoral properties that were associated with camps. Some, um, we did record some massacre locations or places where people had said massacres had taken place. And we also recorded domestic structures that had fortification narratives attached to them because I was particularly interested in those stories about, you know, um, typical pioneer frontier buildings that may or may not have been fortified against Aboriginal attack. And all of that information, all of that information about the camps, the archaeology, the historical archival work, 
all of that went into a single public database made for us by the lovely people at ESS in Melbourne. So for anyone who's interested, this is completely freely publicly available to anyone who wants to access it. It has a web front, which is what you can see in front of you, that kind of summarizes some of the key categories of information that's held in it, but it also has a user guide to help people through it. And you can see from that little note at the top that um, all you have to do to access the actual database that sits behind this web front is do a quick login, takes about 30 seconds, and you have access to all of the material that we've collected. And it's a lot, I can tell you it's a lot. So that database that sits behind that web front contains all of the documents that we have gathered um, from primary sources, from archives, and their transcriptions, all of the historic imagery we've collected about the Native Mounted Police, including historical maps which show camp locations, all of our images that we took during the project, and more importantly for the Histarchs, nearly 16,000 artefacts, which are loosely organised on um, you know, key material classes, but we had to have a couple of special kinds of categories to make our own analyses easier. So you can see weapon and ammunition artefacts is not the ordinary kind of uh, class of object that I would necessarily encounter in most HISTARC. But all of that is um, downloadable as a data set because we wanted this to be available for comparative purposes. And we wanted people to be able to access any of that information and put it together in any way that they liked. And that work is actually still ongoing because even though the money ran out, uh, we're still gathering um, documents and we're still transcribing them. So those numbers, even though I gave you these numbers are from yesterday, they're already incorrect because I know there's been more documents added to it. And we're doing that with the help of uh, a whole set of lovely transcribers from this project called From the Page, which I don't know if any one of you have used it, but it's the first time we've tried to sort of crowdsource that transcription. And it's just been amazing because these people, some of these people are just phenomenal. It's difficult to keep up with them. I find it difficult to keep up with them. They are absolutely amazing. And all of that work together has let us identify some 450 men who were officers in the Native Mounted Police and more than a thousand troopers, although by far trying to work out who the troopers were is, is much more difficult than trying to understand who the officers were. There were staff files that were kept for the officers, but there was nothing like that for the troopers. And the troopers were often given very generic, self-serving European names, which makes it difficult to work out if you're talking about the same man or different men. So this number is always going to be a minimum. And sadly, we probably will never know who most of those men were or where they came from. But the other thing that our database has allowed us to do is try and get a sense of the way conflict unfolded across the colony over time. So another part of that database is an events section where we've documented every kind of conflict event that we can possibly map. And I'll say that there is a, a many of them that are impossible to map for which the, the locations of them are just too vague and too general. So we can't tie them to any kind of spatial um, setting. But the ones that we have been able to map, we've tried to do this to give us a more nuanced understanding of the way conflict unfolded. So like I said at the beginning, we never set out to look explicitly at massacres. So these are the less kind of sensational events, the things that might have prompted conflict or extended conflict or created sets, particular sets of attitudes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Not all of them involve the NMP and not all of them involve loss of life. You can see that one of the categories there that's uh, dominant across most time periods is just attacks on stock or on property, which was carried out for different reasons. But this gives you some sense of how that conflict unfolded. It shows you something about the density of those actions. And when you look at this map, you can see when it gets to Cook, which is that area just around Cairns, sort of south southeastern Cape York Peninsula, you can see there's a real density of activity there. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so one of the things that shows you is the movement of the frontier across time and across space. 
And you can also see that in the density of those 189 camps, which are mapped here for you. It shows you something of the way the various frontiers unfolded. Most of these camps are associated with pastoral activity, but not all of them. Uh, some of them are associated with the telegraph lines across to the Gulf and up the spine of Cape York Peninsula to the tip. Uh, others are associated with mineral fields. So it gives you some idea of how the native mounted police were in every part of the, the colony. There was no, probably no Aboriginal people any, in any part of Queensland who were not affected by their activities. But it also shows you something about uh, repeated activity in a region. So again, if we look at Cook, which is that area, Southeast Cape York Peninsula, remember it not only had the greatest density of conflict events, but you can see it's got native mounted police camps from the 1870s, the 1880s and the 1890s. So it wasn't just a case of the native mounted police going out there once at the beginning of a frontier, but going out there, those camps being moved, those camps coming back and being reestablished over and over and over again. And part of the complications for this area is, it, I think it's partly about population density, Aboriginal population densities, but it's also about European population densities because this is the heartland of the Palmer River. So tens of thousands of people flocked to the Palmer River from 1874 onwards. And all of this makes Cook quite different to the rest of Queensland. It's quite unique and it's, I think, the most interesting part of Queensland to try and unpack all of this conflict activity from. Um, the other thing I want to show you is those concentric lines that are going across the map. This is from work done by one of our students, Tony Pagels, who's looked in detail at the ammunition from all of our camps. So these concentric lines correspond to the main changes in weapons technology across time that made the native mounted police ever more effective and ever more deadly. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to two things. The first is the introduction of what was called the Wesley Richards Pinfire Carbine, which happened in 1868, followed by its replacement, the Snyder Carbine in 1870. And this was the rifle that really went on to become iconic of the Native Mounted Police. It became a byword for NMP dispersals. And you'll find phrases like, a Snyder is a splendid civilizer. So you'll find phrases in the newspaper that take the idea idea of the Snyder carbine and generalized two technologies. So the introduction of the pinfire carbine and the Snyder carbine, and particularly the rifling in the Snyder carbine, uh, became crucial to the native man of police later. And I just want to talk a little bit more about those. So at the top, you can see that's the Wesley Richards pinfire carbine. It's a double barreled weapon, but it's smooth bore. So it doesn't have rifling, All right? Which means for this weapon to be effective, you have to be fairly close to your quarry. For it to work well, right? So that means there are different kinds of tactics that, that are required with a detachment using this kind of gun compared to the Snyder, because the Snyder was rifled, which means it was absolutely perfect for long distance aimed shooting. It was much more accurate across those long distances. And one of the things Tony looked at, he exhaustively went through every historical record, and we found a few that previous historians hadn't found, which was great. But he also looked forensically at all the ammunition we recovered from all of our campsites. And the distinction between these two weapons and the tactics that might have been required from the detachments using these weapons um, shows up quite neatly in the archaeology. So Burke River, which was the camp near Bullia out in far western Queensland, operated through the 1870s into the 1880s. But there is no pinfire carbine ammunition at Bullia. We found not a single one. And you can see the pinfire, like the pinfire carbine operated, uh, was kept in use for quite a long time. So even though it was an old weapon that was only issued for a very brief period to the native police before it was overtaken by the Snyder, some detachments kept using it for a very long time. It extended right into the 1880s with some detachments. None of them at Bullia though. So even though the time period of this camp overlaps with the time period of the, the Wesley Richards, they weren't using it here. And you can see it's obvious why. There's very minimal cover so that the area or the, um, the landscape that the NMP are patrolling here didn't require any of those close quarters combat, combat. They could certainly be a long way away from their quarry and still succeed. If you compare that to Baralga, so this is again the Lower Laura camp, that camp you saw at the beginning, much scrubbier, much more cover. 
At Baralga, there were lots of pinfire carbines. So the difference in these weapons tells you something about the way those detachments had to operate. And we know that the Wesley Richards pinfire carbine was in use in some of the rainforested areas of the Cape as well, so near Innisfail and up near Cardwell. So those areas obviously required very different tactics, and that shows up quite well in the archaeology. Um, in many ways, it's kind of ironic, really, because we set out to do this huge project on the native mounted police camps. But in many ways, the archaeology of the camps themselves turned out to be almost the least interesting aspect of the whole project. And that's because the Queensland police or the Queensland government was always highly parsimonious. So they always wanted the native mounted police to be operated as cheaply as possible which means camps tended to be built from very ephemeral local materials. They had to source the materials themselves a lot of the time and they had to do all the building themselves as well. So most of the camps weren't made with structures that were designed to last for the long term. And most of what we saw on the ground were the sorts of um, small scale things that you'd probably all be familiar with in various historical archaeological sites like ground level stone lines or um, stone fireplaces, things like this. Some features only showed up in geophysics, so we could only see them through the use of geophysics, like the ant bed floors that we re recorded in detail at Baralga. In terms of where the camps were located, though, that was more interesting. So we found that there was a replicable set of um, qualities, I suppose, that a camp had to meet. It obviously needed grass for the horses, so it needed sufficient feed for the horses. It needed sufficient water for the camp, so it needed to be near a permanent water hole or a permanent river. Um, it needed to be near communications networks, preferably the telegraph later in the century, but also roads so that people could contact the native police and they could get communications in and out to headquarters. They didn't want it to be, they didn't want their camps to be too close to public houses or hotels, however, so they tried to keep them away from towns, and they didn't really want them to be on main roads, even though that wasn't necessarily always adhered to. It was even better if you could get your native mounted police camp close to Aboriginal areas of occupation or important Aboriginal travel paths or ceremonial sites that meant just the mere presence of a camp could break up those previous um, communication routes and those previous ceremonial activities. So it was even better if you could get all of those things together and start to disrupt any of those traditional um, Aboriginal occupation or uses of the landscape. So what have we found? Hmm. Good question. Um, in fact, we're still mining a lot of the information that we have. Um, we've only ever had two of our assemblages analysed in detail. One is the Lower Laura Baralga camp, again, by a student from USQ called Leanne Bateman, who did a fabulous job of pulling together an initial analysis of all of the material from that camp. And the other is the Burke River camp at Bullia, which was um, initially analysed by Ursula Artem from Flinders University. And we're still working through those assemblages to try and work out how much more information we can get out of them. So I'm looking at the ceramics from uh, Baralga now to see what else I can say about it. But we've also done a whole series of um, specialist projects to try and sort of uh, focus on particular categories of objects. One of them is the flaked glass that came from several sites, uh, several campsites. So Yinika Purston looked at the glass for us and has analysed it uh, separated out that which is definitely flaked from that which isn't. And um, we're fairly confident that this material was produced by the troopers and or their wives and possibly was used as a replacement for traditional stone sources. Because as you can imagine, troopers are confined to the camp, they're out on patrol, but they're not necessarily free to collect or to know where the best sources of stone are in the environment. And they're not necessarily free to go out and collect them even if they knew where they were. So we kind of, we hypothesize that this glass might've been a replacement for those troopers who are effectively in enemy country. They're using this instead, and they may have been using it for leatherworking or any of the, um, they had to upkeep all of their equipment. So we suspect it may have been used for that. 
Nick Grigorik has looked at the buttons for us. So he's looked at all of the uniform buttons and many of the other uniform accoutrements to help us identify those from the assemblages. But it also let us speculate about the meaning of NMP uniforms to officers, to troopers, and to the wider community, and especially to other Aboriginal people. Marani Litster has looked at the beads for us because we found glass beads in many of our camps. And these were these are the, the typical kinds of trade beads that um, some people have found in Aboriginal sites in the Northern Territory. And they were often given as gifts to Aboriginal people. So they were given as gifts to women to entice them to the camp or sent out into the um, community, like sent out with one person to try and entice Aboriginal people to come in, or they were given as rewards for Aboriginal people who had performed some service for the white community. Um, and Nolan Cole, of course, has looked at the um, culturally modified trees from the Baralga camp, because there's quite a collection of different kinds of culturally scarred trees in that camp, many of which we think belong to the troopers. Um, on top of that, so not we didn't just do archaeology, as you know, this is historical archaeology. And I was particularly interested in looking at standing structures or reports of standing structures that potentially had been fortified on the frontier, because this is something that's been a long-standing interest of mine. So we set out, we did a, a large uh, documentary survey. We looked at a wide range of documentary sources to try and identify any accounts of buildings that might have been fortified. And you can see those in the in the um, map on the right there. And it probably won't surprise you. We found a lot of claims, but many of those were fairly inherently unbelievable, let's say. They were third hand or greater. They weren't uh, specific. They weren't closely tied to the original builders or the original owners or the original inhabitants of those structures, but they were something that had come from community memory or was attributed to an old timer or was too generic for us to take seriously. But having said that, we did find a small subset of accounts that were firsthand or close enough to firsthand. They were either from the original builders and owners or visitors to those structures that are believable. So there's a very small percentage of them, but there are enough of those firsthand accounts to make me think that fortification wasn't unknown of domestic structures. Um, we define fortification fairly broadly as almost any element, defensive element that was incorporated into a domestic structure. So we deliberately went as broadly as possible. But most of what we found was very minimal. It was um, holes bored through walls or through doors. It was barred windows or barred doors or other um, areas of ingress. So nothing that was incontrovertibly fortified, like the blockhouses that you get in New Zealand, or like the telegraph stations that were built on the Cape York line, which is that picture down the bottom there of the Patterson telegraph station. These were absolutely built to be fortified from the outset. And you can see on the right of that Patterson photograph, you can see the little small corrugated iron room, which is on the corner there with a small hole, which is for shooting through. So these were built on diagonally opposite corners of all of the telegraph stations going up the Cape, and they were explicitly for shooting through, and they were designed, they were placed on the corners there to achieve the maximum coverage of the ground around them. They had a whole lot of other features, these buildings, that were um, about protecting the inhabitants from attack, like they had the, the water tanks were underneath the building in a protected area. We found nothing like that in domestic structures, but we did find hints of things. And we also found accounts of structures that had had defensive elements added to them later. So perhaps those structures weren't built originally to be defensive, but after seminal events like the Hornet Bank Massacre in 1857 and the Kalinaringo Massacre in 1861, where large numbers of Europeans were killed in one place, we found that some people did make changes to their structures. And the obvious one is that Hornet Bank example. So in 1857, the entire Fraser family was killed except for one boy. Um, and the Reverend Og, who traveled around that area not that long after, stayed in the homestead. When he stayed in that homestead, they'd already made all of these changes 
to the building. So they'd install bars on the windows and on the doors, they'd install bars on the chimney to stop people climbing down. All of the bedrooms had been um, able to, were now able to be barricaded off as separate spaces. And all of the bedrooms were supplied with their own little armories. So that if anything happened, people could protect themselves and, and not have the same events happen again. Um, we also, as archeologists, of course, tried to track down any physical examples of these kinds of structures, which is much more difficult than finding them in historical records, as you can imagine. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking to people and a lot of time getting um, advice on which buildings people thought had been fortified and almost every one of them had either been changed so much we couldn't see any of the evidence or the evidence just wasn't convincing enough. And so I suppose I'm enough of a skeptic that I need more than just an aperture or a hole bored through a slab to convince me that it's fortified. In the end, we only found a couple that I think are convincing. What we found much more of was this extensive and quite elaborate process of mythologizing these structures subsequent to their building and subsequent to their um, original inhabitants living in them. Um, and this, this happened from about the late 19th century, but right through into the 20th century. And it tied into a whole lot of wider political movements and shifts in the community. And a lot of kind of tropes that you find cropping up in literature, in imagery over and over and over again. So it's that idea of the white pioneer, you know, in the harsh landscape, defending his home, defending his family, his wife and children, like you can see on the right. Um, so this, this process of mythologization makes it much more difficult to tease out which of these structures may have been fortified in actuality from the beginning and which only achieved that kind of symbolic messaging much later in their life. Um, which kind of brings me to the other major element of this project. So like I said, the archaeology was in many ways the least interesting kind of aspect. The other thing we wanted to really understand was how the Native Mounted Police are remembered in the present. So not just what their activities had been in the past, but what that tells us about current Queensland. One of the first things we looked at, of course, was we wanted to know what sites were already registered. When you look at the Queensland Heritage Register, there are no sites that capture Native Mounted Police presence. There's one that kind of slips in by default, which is the Rockhampton Botanic Gardens. So for anyone living in Rockhampton, go and check out the Botanic Gardens, which was the site of a Native Mounted Police camp, but it's not listed for those values. It's listed for its amenity values as a public um, garden. When you compare that to the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Database, there are many sites that are listed on it uh, for, for the Native Mounted Police. Some of them are camps, some of them are murder places, those places where frontier conflict happened. Um, and this kind of contrast sort of got us thinking in a way. And I know there's a whole lot of reasons that these two capture different kinds of information. Like they don't actually record the same sorts of things in the same way. And uh, there is a bulk listing in process now as a result of our project to change that situation on the Queensland Heritage Register on the left there. So there are a lot of instrumental reasons that these two might capture different information, but it got us thinking about how different parts of the community might remember frontier conflict differently and how that might unfold for contemporary and future processes. And I don't know if any of you have looked at this, but for any of you who have ever looked at the Australian Reconciliation Barometer by the, the um, Australian Reconciliation Commission, Council, whatever they're called, there's a lot of really interesting data there, which I think is quite troubling in a way, but certainly complex in terms of unpacking any sort of system of truth telling that we might undertake in the near future. I've only included two things here, which I think are particularly interesting. So if you look at that one at the top, right, this is the percentage of people in Indigenous community, so the general Indigenous community in Australia and the general non-Indigenous community in Australia, who do or don't believe in the frontier wars. And you can see there's pretty similar percentages in both communities who either don't believe it to be true, so don't believe that the frontier war ever took place, or who are uncertain about it. 
like who really don't know whether they should believe about it or not. And I find that really interesting that those percentages are quite similar. And what that, because what that tells me is there's no uniformity in any of those communities. And I guess you wouldn't expect that, but it means that people, even in an Indigenous community, are not necessarily going to be open or receptive to the kinds of research that we've tried to do through our project. So while there's broad agreement in certain things, like you can see 67 and 64%, that's, that's pretty good percentages of those populations who agree. There's also divergence, divergence between communities, but also divergence between states and territories, as you can see from the uh, graph on the bottom. So the one on the bottom asks, do you think it's important to undertake formal truth-telling processes about our shared history? And you can see the variation there across states and territories with the Northern Territory having the highest number of people who don't think it's important at all or fairly unimportant, ACT having the least. So these things aren't consistent and these things aren't uniform, which means there's a range of subject positions that people will take up in this debate and certainly in any truth-telling process going forward. And one of the things, you know, it brings me back to that idea of the Native Mounted Police and their campsites and the archaeology of those places. The archaeology of those places was the archaeology of domestic life, right? It contains all of the normal kinds of ordinary things that all of us would be familiar with from sites in our that we've seen in our career. Maybe with the exception of the number of weapons and ammunition artifacts, but the rest of it, it tells a story about what they ate, what their health was like, um, how they ate their meals, what they did in their spare time, how they treated themselves. It's not a typical or direct archaeology of war. There's no battlefields, battlefields here. There's no mass graves. There's no killings. So the story that you can tell through the archaeology is very different. These camps existed because they were the support network for the Native Manor Police. Without them, the NMP couldn't have gone out on patrol. They couldn't have done any of the things that they'd done. None of that violence could have taken place without these camps. But nonetheless, the archaeology is quite benign. It's um, It kind of hides the reality of what the NMP were out there to do. And what that means is, even with that archaeology, so even with that material evidence that we've so meticulously gathered, those 16,000 artifacts that anyone can have a look at in the database and interrogate in any way that they like, there's always going to be people who refuse to accept that the Native Mounted Police were complicit or active in, in most of the frontier conflict in the 19th century in Queensland. Um, and that kind of suggests to me that the truth-telling process that we're going to undertake in the next three to five years, because you know that's been approved um, or that's been adopted federally, as well as in many of the states, including Queensland, is going to be quite a complicated, tricky and possibly quite difficult process. Um, because people are going to adopt a full range of subject positions in both Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities, the kinds of conversations we're going to have around those issues won't be simple and they won't be straightforward. The other thing we don't know about that process is exactly how it will unfold. Um, I personally lean towards a community-led model for truth-telling. So I, um, I agree with Julian, Lisa and Pat Dodson's combined report that they issued, which suggests that that process should take place at a community grassroots level and it should be carried out in those kinds of ordinary community local organisations in libraries, historical societies, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander associations. It shouldn't be a legislative or legal process as was adopted in South Africa, which some people have suggested it could be. Um, and what I think that will do, well, in a way, I think that process can only be carried out at that local community level in order to be meaningful, but it's going to create a patchwork of truth-telling across the country and across, across states and across the country. And I think there may well be different outcomes in different places, according to the historical context of those communities, according to you know, the particular people who are involved, the contemporary social um, relationships between groups, but it'll be different for each locale. And this is the kind of conversation that we would like our database to speak to. 
all of our objects are going to go to the Queensland Museum shortly, I hope, to become part of their permanent collection. And Nick Hadnut from the museum is going, is in the process of organizing an exhibition of that material. So they're going, the QM is going to host an exhibition of frontier conflict in the Native Mounted Police in Queensland. So what we'd like from that exhibition and from our database is for people to be able to query that data, to use it to construct their own understandings, whether or not those agree with ours or not, but use that data to decide for themselves and to create a context in which people can start to have those conversations about frontier conflict, about truth telling, about responsibility, about the future that I think we really need to have. And I've kind of rushed through that because now I'm at the end, but these are only some of the people that I'd like to thank because there were hundreds and hundreds of people who helped us throughout this project. And I've probably skipped a whole lot of really important information, which I've just forgotten to tell you. So if you've got any questions, I think you should ask me. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Heather. Sorry, I didn't have my video on. Hello. Really? <laughs> Thank Hello. you. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, I think we've all learned uh, an awful lot. I was just um, going to open up the um, the floor, <laughs> verbal floor, um, for questions. If anyone um, has any questions, um, please feel free to um, ask them in the in the chat. Um, so I see that um, some people have already started. Um, but I was just going to start it off whilst everyone thinks of their questions. Um, so how does the nature of the material that you found um, in Queensland, how does that, um, is it different or pretty similar to what people found in um, other states? Do you mean the archaeology of other Native Mounted Police Forces in other yeah. Hasn't been done. Oh, it hasn't been done. Oh, no. archaeologists. Well, historical work on other Native yeah. Mounted police forces in other colonies, but not archaeological work. Um, but I imagine it wouldn't be that different, right? Like we're, we're talking about the same kind of domestic locales for a force. So I think we'd be talking about the same kinds of material remains and the same kinds of systems, support mm. systems that those camps um, connote. Mm. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Well, that's uh, definitely some uh, research projects for the future, everyone, looking at all you guys here today. Um, so I've got a question here. Um, this one's Sven. Um, so he said um, that, oh, the question is, has your work with all its evidence had any traction at state or federal government levels to have the frontier was recognized as Australian wars as a first truth telling step towards reconciliation? Um, so we haven't got to that formal level of recognition. Um, other than you may have seen parts of our work on Rachel Perkins's recent uh, documentary. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. No. So, and I don't quite know how to make that step from all the things we've done and what we've made available to actually getting that into some kind of policy framework. But I think the truth telling process will be important for that. So I think um, we have an enormous number of users of our database. I don't know if you remember that number, but it was over a thousand people, and we had mm -hmm. people every day. We don't necessarily know why those people are joining or using the database, but I think we'll see more of them in the future because, um, like I said, what, what it does is just present all that information to them for them to make up their own minds, for them to interrogate that and put that together in any way that they like and decide for themselves. And I think that's a, a really important, I mean, we've only done it for Queensland, so I don't know how that will work in the rest of the country, but I think that's a really important resource for that truth telling yeah. process. How it will be used, I don't know. And whether we'll actually get that to a higher level, I don't know. Yeah, that's um that's awesome though. It's really great that people interacted with it. Um the other comment on Sven was um while the findings of archaeology may be the least interesting part of the project, archaeology as a method slash process allowed for the sustained time on the project that brought to light the oral histories, mythologies, and so forth. And I think, yeah, that's very interesting that the whole kind of using that kind of archaeological framework, um, using historical um, and oral resources um, that are just at your fingertips. So a bit harder to find, of course, um, is the fabulous. Historical archaeology. Yeah, right? Yeah, it's using that, that multidisciplinary um, aspect of archaeology. And I think that is very um, important and very, um, very exciting stuff, to be honest. Um, yeah. So um, Pitik has asked, um, were uh, the native police paid? Um, 
and did you say that they came from different areas that they were policing inside the general custom? Yeah. So the general custom was to draw the troopers from areas other than in which they'd serve mm. because the point was to break up any um, associations with between them and local people. Obviously, that would prevent them from doing their job. That initial group of troopers who first came to Queensland or what was then northern New South Wales in 1848 came from as far south as the Murrumbidgee and Edwards Rivers, Victoria. So they were taken all the way up into that southern Queensland area. But even after that, you find that um, a lot of troopers were recruited from Maryborough and Wide Bay and taken across the state. So the practice was always to try and separate them from local people and to separate them from each other in a way because they didn't want the troopers to desert. But yes, they were all paid. They weren't paid well. Even the officers mm. paid well and were always complaining about their lack of pay, but the troopers were obviously paid even less and mostly paid in rations. So it oh. was typical. It was exploitative. Indigenous people were, were considered to be cheap, expendable labour sources. So whether... I, I, we don't know how any of the troopers actually saw that pay. Like, we don't know how they regarded those um, those agreements between them and Europeans. Mm -hmm. But there are high desertion rates from many of the Native Manor Police camps, which suggested that Aboriginal people sometimes took that agency into their own hands and just left, although that was a very dangerous mm -hmm. thing for them to do because if they were caught, they could be summarily executed or certainly um, uh you know, um, corporal punishment was certainly a punishment for that. Or they could be killed by local Aboriginal people. So it wasn't a simple or easy thing for them to desert, but they did take that option when they could. Mm. So what um, attracted pe um, people to this job? Like, were they, did they see it as a, a good opportunity? Or do, were they, was it a desperate thing? Or what, yeah, what a, do we have any idea what the motivations are behind people doing it? So we have no direct testimony from any trooper as to why they became a trooper or how that process was affected. So we've, we have written a paper trying to understand this ourselves, because obviously this is something we were trying to get to the bottom of. Who are these men and mm. what would make them do this job? And some of those troopers were in the Native Manor Police for a long time. Like there were, there were also father and son groups and brothers who were in it together, but they were in it for many years. So what would make them stay? And all mm. we can do is is kind of hypothesise, string a story in between the various fragments that we can find in historical documents. And none of those are complete. But mm. certainly I think all of those things that you mentioned are possibilities, like for some of them. And you can imagine, so all of these men are being taken from areas that have already been disrupted by European presence, right? They've already been settled or colonised or whatever word you want to use. So those traditional... Um, areas those traditional systems have been disrupted perhaps their families have been killed like there's already been conflict in those regions they're the men who are being recruited to go into new areas and carry out that process all over again with whoever those local people are so for some of those men and some of them were quite young when they were mm. um, recruited like some of them were, were boys what we would call teenagers now but obviously that wasn't a concept that existed then but very young um for some of them I think it was their only option like they 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 were already um divorced you know from their country divorced from their families that those systems that they knew had already been broken up some of them though seemed to want to become part of the native manor police so we do have accounts of troopers asking to be recruited asking to be joined up much mm -hmm. more difficult to explain some men were actually given the alternative um in prison, they were they were given an alternative for execution or joining the Native Manor Police. So you can imagine which one they would take up. So some of those men were recruited by virtue of um, worse fates in store for them if they didn't. So it's hard to know, Ellie. It's not it's not possible mm -hmm. to know what any of those men felt or thought because there are so few records about the troopers at all. Like most of them like I said, will will remain forever anonymous. They're not even named in historical documents. And for the ones that are, it might just be a name or a date or a place, and there's no other information about them. So it's it's almost impossible. It's almost impossible to know. We have to. We can only imagine what it might have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know for sure that that does make a lot of sense. That we can't put, we can't really understand 
because I mean you're limited by the evidence that you've got so that makes a lot of sense yeah, um, and there just aren't any accounts so none of those trip well, obviously so none of those trip shame. yeah none yeah yeah none of those are wrote about it themselves um yeah just such a shame uh, really because it would yeah it would help you know get into that in the minds of people and like that kind of allowing that kind of empathy to understand what um people were going through um but even I was trying, to, I was gonna say, even trying, trying to understand that for the white officers is difficult yeah. and there's so much more about them in all of the archival records but even mm -hmm. trying to understand why those men would do this job is complex yeah of course absolutely um, so I've got a couple more questions. Um, so someone, um, oh, Celeste, sorry, I made a comment, um, just thanking you, um, and um, that there'll be, uh, yeah, um, thank you for the, for the information and that the map is particularly useful and that's really great. Um, and also uh, for potential protection of those sites. Um, so Peter also asked, um, do you think Indigenous people are accessing your database and is there any information collected about where people are coming from. Um, yeah, so there, there are some Indigenous people who've accessed our database. We don't chase up most of them, but we do try and collect basic information about who they are, where they come from and what they're doing. Lots of them are school children, so school students. Oh, that's wonderful. Because Frontier Conflict is taught as part of the high school curriculum. So every mm -hmm. beginning of every year, we get whole classes of um, high school students joined up. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there are some Indigenous researchers and other Indigenous local, yeah. you know, community people who've um, who've used it. Yeah, yeah, fabulous. That's awesome. That's that's great news. Um, so Dennis has said, um, great overview of the project and its continued relevance. Um, and thanks to you and your silent co-workers. Um, you noticed um, you noted that co-opted Indigenous people. Uh, into law slash paramilitary enforcement was a common colonizing technique. Was there anything unique or different about the Queensland system compared to other Australian colonies or elsewhere? Well, I have to confess, I haven't done the detailed comparison between Queensland and other colonies. It took me six years and in fact, still yeah. ongoing just to do Queensland. So yes. <laughs> um, I think the answer is probably yes, Dennis, that there were differences. And certainly from what I know of the Victorian iteration of the native, man, the native police, they seem to have been much more go-betweens between the white community and Aboriginal communities. So they seem to, uh, not to say they weren't um, not punitive, but they also seem to have a kind of um, triangulation role between those different communities, which didn't really happen in Queensland. I mean, there were some attempts at it, but it wasn't really the point of the NMP. They did that only so that Aboriginal people would know that they were there and they would know what the consequences were if they didn't obey. It wasn't um, it, it wasn't that kind of translation or, um, you know, ambassadorial role. So I think there were differences, but I'd have to do a whole lot more work in yeah. South Australia and New South Wales and Victoria to know that, so I can't tell you the answer now. <laughs> it's totally fair. It's hard to answer things that haven't been That's done yet. Good question, Dennis. <laughs> Yeah, it's excellent, but difficult. <laughs> um, so Lila has asked, um, with such a complicated, complicated and difficult subject matter, what has the reception been with the descendants of the NMP? Um, well, that's been interesting because, like I said, we we did want to talk to descendants of officers and troopers, and one of the questions mm. that we asked them was, how did they feel about their ancestors? So trying to understand how mm. they felt about being related to people who might have carried out those activities and really the thing that um, has always struck me it, pretty much in all of the conversations we had with Aboriginal people throughout this project was how incredibly generous they are to um, non-Indigenous Australians like they they do understand a lot of them think that their ancestors had to do what they had to do like there wasn't a choice but they're very um, open to this process of reconciliation or reparation or whatever you want to talk about whatever you want to call it they're open to some kind of future that is um, more constructive and more collaborative going forward and I always find that an incredible position because I don't know if it was me I think I'd be I'd just be angry 
all the time like just be mm. so bitter about you know the legacy of all of these events and everything that's happened subsequently throughout the 20th century as well it's devastating yeah but that curiosity is incredible and and almost you know everyone had that perspective of just wanting to have this out in the open have this conversation and then find a way to move forward which I think says mm. a lot about um just says a lot yeah, that, that's awesome. Uh, that's that's really good to hear. Um, so in a kind of related note, um, Oliver has asked, um, from my understanding, there's a lot of stigma in regards to being a descendant of a Native police um, person. Um, do you think that the stigma will be less as we learn more and come to terms with this history and understand circumstances of the time? I don't know. I, and I can't really answer that because, like I said, I think that truth-telling process is going to be different everywhere I think it's going to be that patchwork of of community conversations that are happening and they won't be the same across any one state or across the country so I think probably yes and no is the answer to that question mm. and I don't know I think like I, I do try and imagine none of my ancestors were in the native man of police but I do try and imagine what it would be like knowing that you were related to a man whether he's white or black it doesn't matter who was out there and whose job was deliberately to find and kill other Aboriginal people. And mm -hmm. I don't know how I feel about that. I really don't. I don't know how I would incorporate that into my own identity now. Because obviously your ancestors are an important part, right? They're really central to how you understand yourself and your place in the world. So having to add those kinds of extra dimensions, I don't know what that will be like. Mm, no, yeah, that's that's super hard. Um, and you mentioned um about the the wives. Um, so did um did wives um of the Nay police um officers did they travel with them a lot, or would they yeah. be based somewhere while they went somewhere else? Or? No, so that is one thing I forgot to tell you about. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, these are these are absolutely domesticated environments. The troopers have wives and children. The officers often had wives and sometimes very large families of children. So you're getting a lot of people in this space um, constructing all those kinds of domestic familiarity, um, you know, domestic dinners or through children's toys or all the normal kinds of domestic activities we would expect to find anywhere, except they're in these camps which exist only to um, promote the Native Manor Police's activities outside of them mm. yeah but they were all there yeah wow that's, that yeah that's very interesting did you find that that ha tended to happen more at a uh, longer standing camps or was it just kind of any camp um no matter well, sure you get more you get more evidence more physical evidence at those longer lasting camps but um yeah wives and children could be with officers at any camps and often at many camps mm. And they followed their husband so that they're not just living in one place but living in several camps throughout the frontier. Mm, that's, obviously, that's very interesting. Well, we obviously know least about the Aboriginal wives because they, again, were often not named in documents and they were used as like the de facto domestic um, slaves essentially of the camp. They did, they would often collect the water, collect the wood, do the cleaning. So they were essential to the running of those camps, but we often don't even know those women's names or where they came from. Mm, yeah, they can be pretty um, absent in both the historical um, and archaeological records. Um, well, actually, they're present in archaeological. So, yeah, that's that's fascinating, though. I, I had no idea that um, that was the thing that happened. So that's great. I'm sure many people have also learned a lot about that um, this afternoon. Um, so we've got some more um, questions. Um, is there, um, Sue asks, is there any evidence to provide an idea of how many Aboriginal people were killed by the uh, Native police? Uh, yes, I can't give it to you off the top of my head, but you can look at our database, you can look at the events, and we have one of the, you know, one of the pieces of information we've tried to collect is how many people might have been killed or wounded in any of those events. And we've always opted for a minimum number, bearing in mind that um, a lot of the accounts are conflicting, so it's difficult to know. Um, mm. So we, I can't tell you what those numbers are now because I don't actually remember them, but you could That's work good. out how many Aboriginal people and how many white people we've captured in those events. But remembering that those events themselves 
are only a sample of what actually would have gone on because most of that um, information we collected from historical documents, which is obviously biased towards the European viewpoint. And a lot of those events come from the newspapers and um, a lot of the newspapers deliberately tried to beat up the sensational, you know, um, make mm -hmm. events more sensationalized to try and um, beat up those kind of anti-Aboriginal sentiment. So the Morton Bay Courier was renowned for it, was renowned for being outraged at every single event that might have influenced any kind of, you know, white settlers, um, might have affected any kind of white settlers' live, livelihood. So the stuff we have in our database in that event section is biased in many ways, and it's uh, absolutely only a minimum estimate. Most of attacks on Aboriginal people would never have ever been recorded. So in fact, we, we won't ever know the true extent of that. Um, you can read some of the historian's work, like Ray Evans and Robert Auster Jensen did make an attempt to try and calculate how many people might have been killed in frontier conflict in Queensland. They had to use a whole lot of assumptions in order to do that. They had to sort of work out an average length of each camp an average number of patrols, an average number of people who might have been killed on those patrols. And they did that from historical evidence. But they ended up with a phenomenal number, which off the top of my head is something like 45,000. I can't even remember what the number is, but it's an enormous number of people that they argue might have been killed in frontier conflict. Um, mm. Whether or not that's true or how accurate that is or how close that comes, I don't know. Our student, Tony uh, Pagels, also looked at um, looked in detail at the Snyder rifle, rifle, which was in use for 20 years. He looked at the amount of ammunition that was bought by the Queensland government for that rifle, and I think it was something like 19,000 rounds of ammunition over that 20-year period that was bought for that rifle. And he's made a calculation of how many people... So assuming that all troopers were issued with 20 rounds, because that's... Um, that was the standard issue. They had cartridge belts that fitted 20 cartridges. So that was like the standard issue for each trooper. But assuming that even if they only killed one person a year with one of those bullets, um, I think his number was something like 19,000. No, it wasn't. It had to be less than that. I can't remember. But anyway, I can tell you later. Email me later. But yeah, <laughs> it's huge numbers, huge numbers that are really difficult to comprehend or kind of pass in any kind of meaningful way. Yeah, Lindley Wallace has suggested 70,000 people. See, um, even more. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a wild and, number. Well, that's just unimaginable. Yeah. Like, Yeah, and it all depends on, on how you calculate averages for all of those things. So there's mm -hmm. no other fast way to do it. Yeah, of course. That makes a lot of sense. It is horrifying. Um, the... Oh, so Anne Collins has a question. Um, if the children were in camps too, is there any idea of age ranges and is there any evidence of schooling? Uh, hard to know. So there are slates, lined slates and slate pencils, but whether they're evidence of schooling or something else, I don't know. There are certainly toys. So at Baralga, we found a cap gun, the remains of a cap gun, um, and some little ceramic tea set pieces. So like tiny little teacups and... Um, Mm -hmm. So there are physical indicators of those children. And I assume that, you know, we're talking quite young children if we're talking about cat guns and tea sets. But um, no, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of data about those children. We would have to do a whole lot more genealogical research to figure out the size of the families for all of those officers as they moved through those camps. And we've sort of started or tried to do that, but we haven't quite we haven't finished any of that information yet. We're still writing um, summaries for all of those officers and summaries for all of the camps and summaries for all of the troopers, which will take us quite a while. But yeah, mm. that's so there's some information for it, but not good, solid, or total information. Mm. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so Kat M has, uh, has said, um, you noted that the NMP camps were situated close to Aboriginal campsites slash activity locations to try and disrupt their lives as much as possible. Did you find evidence of this in the archaeology of these places? Slash, have you seen these accounts of what happened to these places after the camps were established there? Um, I'm not quite sure what the question is there. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Oh. I'll try and reiterate. Um, uh, I think... Uh, 
I, I think the question is, yeah, did you find evidence um, of the new uh, the uh, NMP sites? Um, is there any evidence of them disrupting uh, the settlements nearby? Um, well, one of the things there is evidence from at several camps, and you can imagine. So, like I said, the native mounted police need to be near permanent water. So they were often occupying the good water holes that Indigenous people would have lived on for generations before that. So they're occupying an area that would have been a prime resource area for Indigenous people. But um, for the same reason, a lot of those camps also are located near stone arrangements, or at least at three of those camps, we think there are stone arrangements near the camp, which are also associated with those locations. So whether that's deliberate or accidental, like whether they're just there for the water and don't, you know, not deliberately there to stop people accessing those stone arrangements or not, the effect would have been the same. So it still mm. would have been that deliberate disruption of any of those former uses of that landscape or those areas. Yeah, of course. And are those um, those stones, are they sacred sites? I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, and I can't, I can't say. I don't know. That's fair. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so Jonathan has asked, um, have any trends been observed in the volume of flaked glass and other contact archaeology uh, in proximity to the NMP camps? Um, yes and no. So we've still got a student looking at that material. So Ursula Artem, who did the study of Bulia, the Burke River camp, she's now looking at the use wear and residue on those same flaked artifacts that Yinika has um, classified for us. So we're hoping that will tell us more about the specific uses of those objects, because at the moment, all we've done is categorize them and work out what we think is definitely flaked and what isn't. We don't necessarily know exactly what they were used for. So we're still trying to explore that in order to understand whether these were made by troopers and or their wives or not. We don't mm. think it was likely that Aboriginal people reoccupied the spaces that were in MP camps, at least not immediately, um, just for all of the connotations that they would have had for local people. Um, it may be that they went back there much later. We don't know. But we, we think it's most likely that this material correlates with Native Manor police occupation. And certainly at the sites that we could excavate, um, you could the excavated material definitely um, correlates with Native Manor police occupation. So we're still trying to, um, the short answer is we're still trying to explore that material to understand it. And we've only kind of scratched the surface at the moment. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so the other question is, um, uh, with, so this is from Jen, or Gen, I apologise. Um, which group of people or industries in Queensland came to be greatest beneficiaries of the frontier land wars and the strategic use of the NMP, um, e.g. the Queensland cattle industry? That would be everyone. That would be every single Queenslander today, including me. I'm a Queenslander, so everyone. Um, obviously, the pastoral lobby, you're right, Jen, obviously the pastoral lobby was a huge supporter of the NMP, so it's something like 30% of the NMP camps were located on pastoral properties because that pastoralist um, enticed them to stay on their property or resource to them, rationed them. Sometimes mm. those pastoralists actually physically built the camp for the native mounted police so that they would come and, and camp on their property. Um, so yes, they, they were obviously huge supporters of it because they were major beneficiaries of it, but so were all of the miners. And so were, so is any contemporary Queenslander really who owns private property in Queensland today because that system exists because we were able to remove Indigenous people from that country through this mechanism. Mm, it's such a cost. Um, so uh, are the sites you have, ex so this is from Fee, so are the sites you have excavated recording on their Queensland Heritage Register database now um, and the I don't know what it stands for, but the D-A-T-S-I-P, um, mm -hmm. it's not a different name, um, site, oh, sorry, of the site you excavated, um, uh, is recorded, oh, are they, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> they're recorded on the, like, the registers um, on the D-A-T-S-I-P, um, so that people um, are aware of these potential sites, like, are they, uh, are they in process of being recorded? Yes. 
Yes, the short answer is yes. So um, there's a bulk listing, like I said, in place to list the camps on the Queensland Heritage Register, but all of our other sites also. Uh, I'm not sure if they are listed by DATSIP yet, but they certainly will be. Okay, fabulous. Yeah, apologies for my, um, my ignorance with the, the Queensland legislation. <laughs> apologies. <laughs> I, um, yeah, um, I'll just see if we've got any other questions. Yeah, so that's great because um, I was going to ask if, um, yeah, if what, um, what legislation can protect these on these sites and is that gonna happen anytime soon? Well, a lot of the, the sites that we could find physically on the ground, and I will say that some people wouldn't let us on their property. So we weren't necessarily mm -hmm. able to look, search for every camp we thought we knew the location of, but the ones we recorded are in places that probably aren't in immediate danger of being bulldozed or developed in the mm -hmm. near future. Um, they're usually on large pastoral properties and certainly after our work, the people who manage or own those properties are aware of them if they weren't before. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose technically once they're entered on their heritage register, they are present, they are protected by that legislation, but I don't know that any of them are in, like I said, particular danger, so I don't know that it's particularly relevant right at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fabulous. Um, my, I, I can't see any other questions. So if anyone has um, any questions, feel free to chat them in soon. But I've got a kind of more kind of um, finalizing question. Um, if anyone doesn't have one, um, oh, um, will this be recorded? Yes. Um, and we will be able to um, upload it onto our website so that you can share it as much as you like. Um, so thanks for asking that, Jen. Um, my other question was, what can we do as archaeologists, um, your professionals, academics, students, whatever, um, how, what, and I suppose the answer to this will depend on where we are at with that, um, what can we do as um, archaeologists to facilitate both this truth-telling process and to, like, kind of um, help um, with protection and kind of that kind of community involvement and engagement? Um, well, it, that's a good question, and I'd be really interested to know if if anyone is doing not necessarily this this project at this scale because we were quite ambitious to take on all of Queensland that was probably <laughs> um, in hindsight but I'd be really interested to know if anyone's doing this kind of project elsewhere or where mm. those sort of um, regionally detailed frontier conflict projects are being undertaken because I think that's the only way we can contribute to that debate trying to untangle a lot of that mythologization but um, the differences in oral historical sources versus historical sources versus the material evidence which is you know unpacking that and putting it back together is complicated enough um, I would be interested to know if anyone's doing these kinds of projects elsewhere because I think they will be incredibly useful to mm. promoting that debate and to having that discussion. Oh yeah, of course. I think that's super important. Um, I do remember someone was doing um, looking at an MP in um in I believe Newcastle. Um, mm. There was a site there that they're looking at. Um, so if anyone knows who that is, um, feel free to tell us. Yeah, sorry. Get in touch with me. Yeah, yes, get in touch with Heather. Um, so if you're doing this or interested in this sort of stuff, please feel free to um, message Heather, I suppose. <laughs> um, it's an excellent idea. Um, so um, one last question. Um, mm -hmm. So from um, Barbara, um, she, um, um, they missed the, the first part of the talk, but um, the type of weaponry that you um, identified at the beginning, um, can you just reach out what that was and is that just the standard and was there um, any deviations from that? Or So one of the things our, our student Tony has done, he's gone through exhaustively every historical document that he can find, that he or, or we could find about ammunitions being supplied to the police and to the Native Manor Police. And he's also looked forensically at all of the um, material that we uncovered. So what he's been able to do is put together a definitive list of the weapons that were on issue to the Native Manor Police. They were more than just those two, but I won't go into them now. Um, but he's also looked at how long 
the older weapons were in use for, and you can imagine as a very parsimonious force that was um, forced to operate on shoestring budgets, older weapons had to be conserved and put into use for a very long time. Uh, so the two I chose were the two kind of most iconic weapons associated with the NMP because that Wesley Richards pinfire carbine was purchased especially for them. So it was bought for them in 1868 and issued to them in 1869, but then it was almost immediately superseded by the Snyder, which became their weapon of choice right through until the 1890s. So I, I did kind of pick the eyes out of that story by picking the two most iconic, but there were more weapons than that. And if you want to know more details, I can refer you to Tony's work, no problem. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Heather. Well, uh, I suppose we should wrap up now. It's getting towards um, 7.30 our time. Um, but so, yeah, I just want to thank you, Heather, for a fascinating talk and for um, finishing off this uh, online seminar with a huge, um, yeah, amazing talk um, that I think we've all learned a lot. And yeah, I just really want to thank you for that and for being a part of that and taking your time. And uh, yeah, I think we've had um, a great series of talk and um, I look forward to doing um, this all again next year with new talks uh, made from New Zealand Pacific. Um, so um, please feel free to um, come and join us on those again next year. So we'll have another exciting uh, range of talks next year. So keep your eye on the actual website and our emails. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, and I hope you have a great break um, over the rest of the year. <laughs> well, Yes. <laughs>